The purpose of my talk is to demonstrate the ways the physical qualities of multilingual dictionaries and language manuals were in conversation with works of printed drama in early modern England. Attention to these cross-generic characteristics, I argue, helps us to see plays in a new light, not according to traditional, nationally informed views, which still inhabit the way we think about Shakespeare and other playwrights, but rather as texts and performances animated by what I term cosmopolitan vernaculars. And in some ways, this is the ideal venue for this talk. So briefly, I recruit this term uh, from post-colonial theory and studies of early Sanskrit and Latin in order to analyze how non-classical languages in the Renaissance mingle and converge in the bibliographical features of plays and multilingual publications for language learning. Latin and Greek drift in and out of the picture as well, so the division is not a hard and fast one, as you'll see. For this project, I've examined over a thousand surviving copies of multilingual language learning books, that includes bilingual language learning books, alongside works of printed drama at dozens of research institutions, and I have uncovered striking connections between playbooks and these kinds of linguistic publications. In my remarks today, I will talk about how overlapping typographical conventions, patterns of handwritten marginalia, and binding techniques demonstrate the categorical blurriness of linguistic publications and printed plays. Understood in conversation with books designed for language learners of French, Italian, and Spanish, and my concentration will mainly be on Italian, so just be forewarned. We see early modern English plays differently, not as monuments of literary triumph, but rather as cosmopolitan linguistic products of authors, printers, and readers engaged with books and languages from beyond England's borders. So as I kind of said, I'll be looking at three particular sites uh, in this talk of cosmopolitan vernaculars across plays and language manuals. And the first one, as scholars including Stephen Galbraith and Anne Coldiron have discussed, multilingual books issued in early modern Europe often differentiated languages by typeface. Black letter for English or German, for instance, uh, italic for Italian or Roman for French or Latin. And there are other configurations, and certainly these typefaces were used for other purposes too, which I won't get into. Um, but there were these linguistic uh, purposes. An especially representative book of this kind for the early modern era is Noel de Berlamont's Colloquia et Dictionariolum, which um, is pictured here. And it was printed in the 1520s originally uh, and appeared in over 150 editions over 300 years, printed in Portugal, in Spain, Italy, England, France, Germany, um, in other words, this is a really popular book. It displays as many eight, as eight languages across its columns and features in its most expanded form a guide to letter writing, a pronunciation treatise, a brief dictionary, and a set of seven lively dialogues. And it was also, as you can see here, uh, printed in a variety of oblong formats, including the rare and unusual decimo or tenmo. Um, and um, so, we see kind of a range of shapes that this book could take, as well as uh, the variety of countries it was published in. Uh, the dialogic aspect of books designed for language learners, including this one, has led many scholars to assess them as theatrical. But we can dwell on their mise en page to analyze the specific features that they share with printed plays. In this book, The Colloquia, each dialogue begins with a list of featured speakers, which I've highlighted for you. You can see um, uh, the variety of speakers who will be listed uh, as the dialogue unfolds, a kind of language learning version of a playbook's dramatis personae catalog. And much like a scene in a work of printed drama from the same period, speech prefixes appear down the left margin with language attributable to one character or another. Also like works of printed drama, this book associates particular languages with typefaces Roman for Spanish, Italic for Italian and Portuguese here, and black letter for English. If we turn to look at a playbook such as Thomas Kidd's Spanish Tragedy, which ends with a spectacular multilingual play within a play, 
and which features, sm features smatterings of Italian, Spanish, and Latin throughout, we can see foreign words and phrases singled out in italic against the usually Roman typeface throughout the text. For instance, when the protagonist Hieronimo utters an Italian proverb after encountering his enemies, his words appear in italic type. And this is sometimes used in a lot of other plays as well. Uh, in this 1602 edition of the play at the British Library, however, we can observe how a reader not only took notice of this distinctive typographical decision, but mimicked it with an Italian script in the margin. And I'll talk a little more about paleographical evidence in just a moment. Not only did these playwrights' works share a number of typographical conventions with language learning publications or dictionaries. In fact, both texts were issued by the same stationers with some frequency. Henry Denham was responsible for John Barrett's multilingual alviary dictionary, and some of you write, might remember the so-called Shakespeare's beehive a few years ago, um, a, a particularly annotated copy of this book. Along with, um, and Denham was also responsible for dramatic editions of plays of Seneca and Nicholas Udall. Adam Islip printed plays by Ben Jonson, Robert Greene, and George Peel, along with Randall Cotgrave's massive 1611 French-English dictionary. Thomas Perfoot issued language manuals by Claudius Holyband, as well as dramatic works by Thomas Haywood and John Marston. And I could go on with other examples. Um, I'm not arguing that these were the only kinds of publications these stationers were handling at all. Um, but their treatment of both these linguistic publications and plays offer a useful background for these crossing patterns of typography, um, as well as the handwriting and bindings that we'll see in other examples. So that takes us to the second site uh, of cosmopolitan vernaculars that I'll talk about, which is in handwritten marginalia. So we'll leave this up for a second. Overlapping patterns of paleographical evidence I've found in both language manuals and dramatic publications offer further proof of a link between language instruction and the theater in early modern England. Now, scholars have established decades ago uh, that these kinds of books were known to playwrights, including Shakespeare, but not limited to Shakespeare. But my survey of hundreds of these publications has shown me that a very large variety of readers took up these books as well, with their pens in their hands and with, their, with plays on their mind. So I'll talk about a couple examples. Held today at the University of Pennsylvania, an annotated copy of John Florio's 1578 book of Italian and English dialogues entitled First Fruits, shows how readers using these kinds of vernacular language manuals could do so in a way that mingled language learning with drama. Here, an early user of this book inscribed at the book's end a prologue from a 17th century play. In this copied-in passage, the speaker reprimands an antsy audience before the play begins, and I'll read it for you. But it's not directed at you. You who sitting here do stand to see our play, which must this night be acted here today. Be silent, pray, though you aloud do talk. Stir not a jot, though up and down you walk. For every silent noise the players see will make them mute and speak full angrily. O oh, tarry here until you do depart. Gentle your smiling frowns do us impart. And then we most thankless, thankful will appear and wait upon you home, but yet stay here. Every silent noise. Um, if you've never heard of this passage before, there's no need for alarm. The prologue belongs to a lost play, and it doesn't seem possible to identify the work of drama at all, by title, by playwright, company, or other context. However, Tiffany Stern has found that this passage exists elsewhere in 17th century print, in miscellanies, severed from its original context and placed among poems and jests. We also know who the annotator is in the case of this particular book at Penn, the 17th century ecclesiastical judge and antiquary, Richard Parsons. He signs his name right there. Importantly, Parsons' annotations diverge from the miscellany versions of this prologue. Could he have brought this copy of First Fruits with him to the theater, copying down the verses as he heard them or shortly thereafter? It's impossible to know, and that's too, far too speculative for a claim for me to make here. But what's clear is that this reader saw Florio's book of bilingual language learning dialogues as a fit and convenient place to reflect on a work of drama. 
A second paleographical example that I'll raise here is a bilingual Italian-English grammar and dictionary, which it seems was owned and annotated by the poet, translator, and dramatist Mary Sidney Herbert, the Countess of Pembroke. We can associate this book with the 16th century Sidney family on account of an inscription pointing to a Lady Sidney midway through the volume. And this is probably the Countess's mother, uh, Mary Dudley Sidney, also the mother to Sir Philip Sidney, the poet. At the end of the volume, a leaf that belonged to the book before its 1604 binding uh, in vellum features several very fascinating inscriptions. At the bottom, the signature Maria Sidney, along with the terzina from Petrarch's Triunfo della Morte, which Mary Sidney Herbert herself translated into English as the triumph of death. Um, and there are some other inscriptions throughout the book um, in more uncertain hands, um, glossing Thomas's entries with further clarification and adding new headwords too. I'm sure you're wondering, is this really the Countess's handwriting? Um, I've been wondering this too for about a year and a half. And um, I don't think that the case is ironclad. But considering the evidence here, I do think it's a reasonable stance to entertain. And I'd be happy to talk more about that evidence later. Um, I bring it up here because it helps us to consider how an English playwright might use language manuals and dictionaries to their advantage for explicitly literary purposes, and purposes which included translation and drama, eventually. Now, I want to include here um, an example from printed drama as well um, to emphasize how readers of printed playbooks sometimes annotated their books with the conventions one finds in uh, extant copies of bilingual or multilingual dictionaries or language manuals like the one pictured here. The example of the British Library copy of the Spanish tragedy offers a case in point, but to this one I'll, I will add uh, a copy of Christopher Marlowe's Edward II at the Austrian National Library, pictured here. Although the annotations in this book only occur in the first two gatherings, they show a reader concerned with the glossing or translation of Marlowe's language and this instance branches into Latin. Taking up the conventions one finds printed or inscribed in bilingual dictionaries from the same era, our reader translates into Latin Marlowe's words, share, gasped, embers, and fan, underlining the printed words and leaving the translations in the margins. And I found other examples of this in other uh, copies of printed plays. Um, here we have a copy of an English language play in an Austrian library, glossed in Latin, and for a scene in which a monarch is returning from France to delight in Italian masks with his court favorite. This is a series of transnational and uh, translinguistic crossings that we can glimpse in the pages of this book. Uh, and this is the kind of evidence that I'm looking for as I'm trying to bridge translation studies with book history in meaningful ways. Though few in number, the annotations in this Marlowe book bear witness to the intersections between multilingual lexicography and language learning on the one hand and early modern drama on the, on the other. The final example I'll talk about today um, across multilingual publications and works of drama takes place in the arena of early bindings. Here I'm building on Jeffrey Todd Knight's work on the way early collectors of printed books sometimes forge links between otherwise disparate texts by binding them together. As Jeffrey Mastin has shown in regard to a previously unattested copy of Marlowe's Edward II in Germany, different from the one I was talking about just a moment ago, these kinds of binding techniques place English drama in conversation with continental European publications across borders, across languages, and across religious confessions too. The case study I'm going to talk about involves a series of books that belong to the 16th century scholar Gabriel Harvey. Harvey's fascinated researchers of early modern reading and handwriting for decades, so you might be thinking right now of his frenzied annotations up and down the pages of books like this one at the Folger. However, my investigation of several of his books at three different libraries offers a fresh picture of his vernacular language studies and how they involved, crucially, drama. In an essay published in 1940, Caroline Borland identified a number of language manuals 
that once belonged to Harvey and which he annotated copiously with an array of marks and his characteristic unmistakable autograph. And two examples of this appear on the left. Held today at the Huntington Library, these printed guides to French, Spanish, and Italian have received recent attention in interesting essays by Joyce Borrow and Warren Boucher, and they're often considered alongside Harvey's copy of John Florio's First Fruits, which is on the right. However, as Andras Kissery has deduced, one of these language learning publications at the Huntington, which is here, a translated Italian grammar printed in 1575 by the French Huguenot refugee, Thomas Vitrolier, is distinct in that Harvey grouped it with several continental dramatic publications. And I know I'm getting in here into continental publications, and that strains a little bit against the, the textures of English drama that I was including in my title. Um, but I'm, I'm doing that purposefully. I hope to challenge the boundaries uh, in separate nationally uh, oriented bibliographical fields in the early modern era uh, to, enter, to, to raise new questions about transnational and translinguistic possibilities. Um, this grammar's octavo format sets it apart from the other Harvey language manuals at the Huntington, which are in quarto. Also, like the, unlike the others, it has not been numbered by Harvey, possibly suggesting it served a different, if related, purpose. An inscription on the Italian grammar's title page reads in Latin, and I'll translate it for you, Axiophilus's, and this was Harvey's nickname for himself, first technique for the Italian language, grammars, Grammar, comedies, tragedies. An, a, a different inscription at the end of the book adds, no finer or pithier examples than in the excellent comedies and tragedies following, full of sweet and wise discourse, a notable dictionary for the grammar. And exactly what that dictionary is is not entirely clear, but I'd be happy to talk about that too. These inscriptions led Borland to speculate that when Harvey owned the book, some Italian plays were bound with the grammar, her words. Kizari has found this to be indeed the case, interpreting the Samoban's portioned off and highly annotated segments at the Huntington, the Houghton, and the Folger Library as proof of this particular reader's interest in what he calls exemplary conversation. And I'm thinking about these books in, in quite a different way. The formerly bound together books are at the Folger, Ludovico Dolce's Italian renditions of Medea and Tiestes, printed in Venice, 1566, at Harvard, Erasmus' Latin translations of Euripides, Hecuba, and Iphigenia, printed by Aldus Minucius in 1507, and an Italian edition of Terence's comedies issued in Venice in 1549, also at Harvard. So again, thinking about these texts from a different vantage point, I've uncovered further evidence linking the books together, both in this 19th century auction catalog and in the reddish colored markings on the book's four edges, making it unmistakable that these books were together as a unit, as Harvey understood them. Altogether, Harvey's instruction, uh, Harvey's choice to join an Italian grammar to Italian plays offers an illustration of how language instruction and drama could overlap in the binding techniques used by collectors and readers in early modern England. And Harvey is an exceptional case in some ways, but we can imagine how his decisions might inform the thinking that others could have in this period. The examples that I've been talking about today show that drama existed not on its own terms in Renaissance England, but in relation to dozens of multilingual dictionaries and language manuals for learners of French, Italian, Spanish, and other languages. I'll conclude with a final example that illustrates how many more questions await us when we consider printed plays with foreign languages together. This example appears in the pages of a 1632 Shakespeare folio at the Biblioteca Marciana in Venice, Italy. Once the property of the 18th century dramatist and book collector Apostolo Zeno, this volume also features 17th century annotations and the inscription in Prague, suggesting that the book traveled through the European continent before finding its home in Venice. The annotator's markings appear in both English and in German. And if you're wondering whether or not I'm going to show you a photo of it, I will, I promise. Perhaps the most interesting of all the annotations here are those in the text of The Merry Wives of Windsor, a play widely known among Shakespeare scholars as Shakespeare's most English comedy. 
Here, our reader translates the comic go-between character, Mistress Quickly, into Fraulein Schnellfuss. And, and here you can see a close-up of this inscription. The transnational crossings here could hardly be more layered. An English messenger character based on the Mezzana archetype in Italian drama is rechristened in a German guise at the hands of a bilingual reader, possibly in Prague, and almost certainly on the European continent. This is all the more striking when we recall that Shakespeare's collected works in print were advertised for sale in Germany before they were ever available for purchase in London. Surrounded by and in conversation with foreign language manuals, multilingual dictionaries, and grammars and dialogues for language learners, the plays of Shakespeare's England were sites for cosmopolitan vernaculars. Thanks. <laughs>